Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm an assistant director for the Thomistic Institute. And we're back here with another installment of Off Campus Conversations, where we follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker and chase down some of the insights that he or she will have given on campus for a lecture or for a conference or for a intellectual retreat. And so for this installment, I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Frank Beckwith. Uh, thanks so much for joining. It's, it's great to be on. Thank you, Father, for having me. Um, as it turns out, I heard you speak first uh, when I was at Franciscan University of Steubenville as an undergrad, um, specifically about your conversion and um, the difficulties that that posed with your involvement with the evangelical movement. Um, but for those who don't know you, for those who didn't hear you speak at Franciscan University of Steubenville in 2008, um, would you say a word of introduction, uh, maybe who you are, what you do, and why that matters? Sure. <laughs> uh, I am... My name is Francis Beckwith. I am a professor of philosophy at Baylor University, uh, where I also uh, serve as the associate director of the graduate program in philosophy. I've been at Baylor now for tw over 20 years. This is my 21st year at Baylor. Uh, most of my work as a philosopher concerns issues of law, uh, ethics, a uh, little bit of philosophy of religion. Uh, you mentioned that I am a that I had come to the church uh, not too long ago, and that's true. But I'm a revert, uh, so uh, I grew up Catholic, uh, left the church as a youngster, and then returned seven almost seventeen years ago now, uh, while I was serving as president of the Evangelical Theological Society, and I subsequently resigned uh, a week after uh, being received into the back into the church, which is actually not that difficult for a revert. If you've been confirmed <laughs> and baptized, you just have to go to confession. And so I went to confession and then informed the board of ETS that what I had done and told them that I thought I could remain as president, <laughs> even, <laughs> even though I was Catholic, because ETS is a very minimal statement of belief is inspiration of scripture and the Trinity. And I, you know, I didn't say this, but I could have, you know, uh, we invented that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, after a couple of days of thinking about it and talking to Catholic friends, especially two priests that I had grown very close to, they recommended that I resign. And I did. And I think it was the right thing. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the philosophy department at Baylor University, or maybe who have heard whisperings that it's a sneakily uh, tucked away powerhouse, um, <laughs> could you say a word about maybe some of your colleagues and the types of programs that are available there? Yeah, we have uh, a doctoral program in philosophy and have some really outstanding people on the faculty. Uh, we've got Alex Pruce. Uh, he was the director of our graduate program. Some of your viewers and listeners may have heard of Professor Pruce. He's probably, I, I don't think this is an exaggeration, one of the top five philosophers of religion in the world. We have Thomas Hibbs on the faculty, who is a uh, former president of the University of Dallas, former dean of our honors college, a great Aquinas scholar. Tom Ward, uh, those are just a few off the top of my head. We've got, oh, t other Todd Burris, my department chair, who is an expert in modern philosophy. Uh, Charity Anderson, uh, a epistemologist, Ann Jeffrey, who does uh, ethics and political philosophy. Uh, it's a it's an exciting department to be in. We have, uh, I think, uh, some of the finest. Christian philosophers in the world. And we've had many people over the past 10, 20 years study with us and go on to acquire employment, <laughs> which, which in the world of philosophy is, is a little <laughs> bit more difficult uh, than, than, let's say, other disciplines. And I think one reason for that is we have this wonderful niche. Uh, we have a very strong commitment to the mission of Baylor, which is a, a Christian institution, although it's not Catholic. A third of our faculty in the philosophy department are Catholic, and we also have all the others are, are one sort of Protestant or another, but they're very committed Christians, and we work well together. And so it's a wonderful kind of 
ecumenical community in the best sense of the word. Uh, you know, we have our disagreements, but we also have our common commitment uh, to the Christian mission of the institution. Yeah, that's, I, I remember kind of happening upon it at one point because like Baylor grads kept cropping up. Um, like I was at a Thomistic Institute talk given by Scott Cleveland. He was talking about his formation. He was talking about the vices and he was talking about his formation on the passions from a professor who had been there and has now moved on. And then I, I came to, you know, have a conversation with somebody at Steubenville who was talking about hiring at, at the university. And I guess Brandon Dom and Logan Gage, who are both at Baylor, had been hired recently. I was like, man, this is just, this place is just churning out quality products, it seems. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're yeah. very proud of, of, of graduates like Brandon and, and, and Logan, who, uh, they're both, as you mentioned, at Franciscan, but they're also in leadership capacities, which, as well as Scott Cleveland, who I, I believe uh, is at University of, well, he's at University of Mary. I think recently he had been director of the, or may very well still be the director of the Catholic Studies program there. So one thing that we, we're, we're quite proud of is not only how our graduates have succeeded in just teaching and scholarship, but they've actually risen to positions of, of, of responsibility at academic institutions that do have a very serious Christian mission. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> a sneakily hidden away yeah. announcement slash advertisement for a sneakily hidden away philosophy powerhouse. Um, but rather than talk further about Baylor and its uh, academic credentials and its evangelical outlook, I thought that we could talk a little bit about relativism. Um, you've given a couple of lectures for the Thomistic Institute on relativism from various approaches, um, you know, all of which are, are, are just very helpful in diagnosing uh, our 21st century conundrum and then also offering something in the way of prognosis so as to inform our practice when it comes to, okay, toleration or, or mercy or whatever other virtues should inform our engagement. I thought maybe we could start by just kind of motivating the question. Um, like, what is it that our secular contemporaries see in relativism? Like, what does it get them? Uh, because I think that at times uh, we don't do a great job of, you know, seeing it from their vantage. Like, are they are they worried about potential oppression or are they worried about, um, like, the enforcement of potentially alien claims that they will have no truck? Like, what is it that, that motivates this type of response? Yeah, I, you know, it's something that, I, I've been critiquing relativism for as long as I can remember as a, as a grad student. Then my, when I became a professor, I've, I've never been a fan of relativism. <laughs> uh, but the thing that you, you raise a really important question that never really occurred to me until about maybe 25, 26 years ago, I was given a lecture uh, I was giving a lecture at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, which was the place where I had my first job I, when I out of graduate school. And I was giving a lecture on relativism. And there was a, a faculty member in the audience from, I think, the history department. And she was critical of, of my talk. And she said something that really kind of gave me a perspective on why certain people embrace relativism or why large numbers of people want to embrace relativism. And she gave this kind of historical narrative of all the bad people in history who have done really bad things have, they did them because they believed they were right. <laughs> and so the way we make sure there are fewer atrocities in history is to stop believing we're right. Now, she didn't quite put it that I'm giving a sort of uh, Reader's Digest version of it, but that was sort of the kernel of her claim. And I thought, oh, so when I, let's say, look at or you or somebody else looks at certain atrocities or evil deeds, some of us just say those are evil. And one of the problems with human nature is that it's fallen and that we are susceptible to certain types of temptations. And for a variety of reasons, it, we could be enculturated that way. We don't have mastery over our emotions. We can have, you know, disordered desires, all these things that, that affect us and affect cultures. 
But we do believe, though, that there is ultimately something truly good to which human beings are ordered. But not everyone looks at it that. So, so, so what my interlocutor was thinking, she looked at the exact same data and thought, oh, the problem is believing you're right, <laughs> rather than other sorts of considerations. And to me, that was, a, that was an eye opener. And you usually see it in in uh, a kind of argument that you off that one often hears in a pithy way defending relativism and it's something i bring up in the in in the lecture i i give for Thomistic institute and that's the argument from tolerance so you'll often hear people th say something or think something like this the problem in our society today is that is that we ought to be more tolerant of, of disagreement. And so the way we, uh, the way we get around this, the way we resolve it is to not be as confident in the truth of our own views. And so there's automatically a connection between, you know, denying that there's any objective moral truth and affirming a kind of tolerance. I ultimately think that's a flawed argument for a variety of reasons. Uh, I mean, one is that there's no correlation between tolerance and relativism in the sense that one could be a relativist and say something like this. I don't believe there's any right or wrong that's objective, but I do like my culture. <laughs> so therefore, I have no problem oppressing people, right? So that, like that, there's, you, the point is that you can actually get intolerance from relativism. There's, there's no sort of logical connection. Uh, so I think that what motivates a lot of people to embrace relativism is a kind of fear that believing that, that the bad people in history or the bad people, the sort of unattractive, dogmatic people that they know uh, are not relativists. Uh, they're, too, they're too sure of themselves. And so the way we cure this ailment is to affirm some kind of relativistic point of view. It, it strikes me that, so there are various ways to approach the question speculatively and practically. Like speculatively, you've outlined, you know, a kind of range of positions. On the one hand, uh, there's the position of those who foreclose on like noetic access. Uh, this would be like the hardline skeptics. Uh, on the other hand, there's those who would say something more along the lines of like epistemic humility, like, ah, you know, we can know, but we're also fragile, uh, so we can't know too terribly well. Uh, and then you'd have, you know, like a, a, a faith claim on the other end of the spectrum, which would be like, yeah, we can know, and that's assured for us or epistemically kind of verified for us by revelation. And yet still we remain fallible insofar as we can defect from the thing. I don't know if there's anybody who claims, you know, to know because he knows um, except that that's how Tolstoy describes Napoleon in War and Peace. It said something along the lines of like, he comported himself as one who could do no wrong, not because his behavior conformed to an extrinsic standard, but because his behavior was his behavior. Um, so we all recognize that as a kind of madness. But then practically speaking, you know, you, got, you have like the positions that correspond. Um, and you might think skepticism would lead to toleration or tolerance. But like you said, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, there is a kind of place for tolerance, it seems, insofar as we tolerate the free will of others. You know, God tolerates our free will, so it starts there. And, but there's certainly kind of more, like, I suppose, Christian commitment to, to mercy, whereby you realize the misery of another person and you seek to alleviate that. Uh, but I think that people just over assume that if you adopt a skeptical position or a relativistic position, that that will lead in turn to tolerance and whatever secular version of mercy uh, they want to secure, but truth be told, that's that's not often what arises. Um, so, so like, why why is the incoherence of this position not thrown back on its you know purveyors? Like, why why does it remain something that's so uh, embraced by the culture, or so espoused by by many thinkers? Yeah, I, I you know I I don't really I don't really know. I mean, I've got different guesses, <laughs> different yeah. uh, theories of why this is the case. I I think one one. Uh, reason is that in our wider culture, there's this assumption that in order for a knowledge claim 
uh, to be valid or sound. It must in some way conform to the deliverances of the hard sciences, or at least be modeled after scientific reasoning. And since morality and moral reasoning isn't as clear cut as at least, you know, in some, you know, borderline cases or, you know, we find widespread disagreement on a variety of issues among people. Therefore, uh, it's not a form of knowledge. And I mean, it's, it's funny, you go back to someone like Aristotle, who says, you know, we shouldn't expect from ethics, a kind of precision that we get from mathematics or, 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 or what we would say today, the sciences. But I do think one is the kind of lack of confidence uh, in the ability uh, to have kind of firsthand, first-person awareness of certain moral principles. But I think most people who who say that in some ways betray that belief. So, you know, the the person that appeals to epistemic modesty, well, aren't they assuming that modesty is a virtue? I mean, they're not doubting that. <laughs> Right. So or the individual that is confronted with clear cut counterexamples. So, you you know, somebody says, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe morally. There is no objective right or wrong. And you come up with, well, what about, you know, torturing children for fun? And, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, you you get this reaction of like, I, I'd never thought of that before. Uh, so I do think that that. We also tend to focus on cases or debates in the public sphere. So, um, you know, we, we think of moral disagreement over issues like abortion or the nature of marriage. Uh, there are focus, but, uh, but most of the moral uh, questions that we have to confront in ordinary life are simple things like, uh, should I skim money from, <laughs> from, uh, from my boss, right? Uh, should I cheat on my taxes? Should I take money from my mom's purse? Should I, uh, tell a white lie to my wife? You know, these, these are sort of the, you know, ordinary daily moral experiences are not difficult cases. They're only difficult insofar as they may put us in a position where we have to be accountable to others in an embarrassing way, but that's not a moral dilemma. That's just sometimes doing the right thing when it's difficult. But I think that the focus, at least in, in the context of the U.S., is always on these controversial moral questions. But even there, and I, this is what I point out in, in my lecture, my TI lecture, is that even on those issues, both sides often will appeal to the same kind of goods. So think, for example, on the issue of abortion. Uh, one side, the pro-life side, says that it is wrong to kill innocent persons intentionally. But guess what? The other side holds the exact same view. The difference is the pro-choice side denies that unborn human beings are in fact persons, or at least most of them do. There are few who concede the personhood of the unborn, but argue that it's a form of trespassing for the fetus to live inside its mother's womb without her permission. But still even there, there's an appeal to a kind of intuition about bodily autonomy that people generally have. So even on issues like abortion, over which there is deep disagreement in terms of what is the right uh, answer to the question, still, you never find, for example, somebody on the pro-choice side arguing, yes, it's right to intentionally kill innocent human persons without justification. What they will say is the unborn human being is not a person. It doesn't exhibit certain characteristics that give it moral status. Now, I think that position is wrong and I've argued against it, but it helps us better understand why people may not agree with those of us who believe in the sanctity of human life. It's not because they reject certain moral principles. It's because they have a different metaphysical understanding of what constitutes a being's moral status. Yeah, I think I think the way that you argue that is is helpful for our own practice because I think that 
uh, at least recently, a lot of argumentation just devolves into positing bad faith in your inter interlocutor and then shouting. Um, so, all right, we're presuming good faith, so we're presuming a kind of commitment to principles and then the prosecution of whatever line of reasoning is attendant thereupon. Uh, but it still strikes me that there's, like, you know, a difference between those who would, you know, I guess, advocate for or set forth relativism as a legitimate option in the speculative order, and those who do not, um, regarding, like, one's approach to the natural law or whether one's concession of such a thing as the natural law. It strikes me that, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, for those who would argue for the existence of the natural law or who would concede, I suppose, uh, the force of the natural law, there's a sense that, like, we're constituted with natures in a network of relationships and that within that network of relationships, uh, various claims are, um, what would the word be? There are various claims on our humanity as to how we ought to comport ourselves on the basis of what we are and the relationships that obtain. Um, and so that being said, you have some, you know, rough sketch of a kind of right and a kind of wrong, which admits of no like bracketing. You can't just say like, let's set that aside, um, on account of the fact that we haven't constructed it from some societal basis or for some political basis. Whereas those who hold for a kind of relativism, it seems that, that, that part of it is also, uh, a distancing themselves or a holding off at arm's length this notion of natural law as laying claim to their humanity, both in itself and then within the setting of relationships. Could you tease out, because I know you speak also um, on the natural law, could you tease out some of the con like the connections, I suppose, between relativism and then this kind of bracketing of the natural law? Yeah, so there, yeah, so let's, let's just first mention or discuss what it, what is the natural law. So, uh, they could have a whole series of podcasts <laughs> just on, on that question, but it's yeah. in, in a sort of real quick and fast way. It's uh, awareness of certain moral duties that one has that are not the result of kind of social artificial institutions. Now they could be manifested in, in that way. So, um, something like, uh, our awareness that life is, it is a good, uh, gets manifested, uh, in our sort of inclination to, uh, to, to live in a way that is consistent with our nature as human beings. So for, for instance, uh, you know, the immediate awareness that people have when they hear about, let's say, an unjust killing. And, so, you know, the, the, the idea that if you told somebody, well, that is something that is only wrong because uh, the government says so, it's the result of positive law. They would say, no, if the positive law, in fact, did not condemn this type of activity, uh, the positive law would in fact be wrong or mistaken. So it's a kind of, uh, now I think natural law ultimately only makes sense if there is a lawgiver. And uh, there is uh, a debate among Catholics about how best to understand uh, the natural law. My own view is that you can't have natural law without natures, uh, that, that, uh, that, but, it doesn't mean, though, that somebody who, let's say, denies that there are such things as natures doesn't have an awareness of the natural law. I mean, one could epistemically say, I don't believe there's such a thing as natures, and yet uh, conduct their lives uh, and live in a way that sort of is inconsistent with that belief. Um, so when I talk about awareness of the natural law, I'm not saying that the individual that, in fact, has an awareness of this somehow also it is conspicuously committed to the entire metaphysical uh, point of view that many of us believe natural law requires. So uh, when I teach, I, I teach a course at Baylor called Contemporary Moral Problems, and I have my students read uh, two, um, two essays. One is excerpted from 
Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. It's the five, five, first five chapters of Mere Christianity where Lewis gives a very popular brief account of our awareness of the natural law and then ties it into belief in God or that you can't have a natural law without a lawgiver. And I also have my students read Michael Roos and E.O. Wilson's essay that appeared in the mid-1980s, I think in Scientific American, where they make an argument for why Darwinian naturalism best accounts for these intuitions that we have that we attribute to the natural law. And I have my students read both because it turns out that both Roos and Wilson and C.S. Lewis begin at the exact same place. I mean, they, one of the things that Roos and Wilson argue is, you know, it's pretty clear that if you look at human civilizations, uh, there's a common core morality that every society has prohibitions against killing, laws about marriage, uh, the obligation that parents have to children, uh, laws about theft and property, uh, what we associate with criminal law and civil law. Now, there's going to be disagreements, and those disagreements, uh, you know, arise for a variety of different reasons. But they, one of the things that Roos and Wilson point out is that there's this core. Uh, Lewis says the same thing. And so the point that I make to my students in class is that you have, in the case of Wilson and Roos, I think, an awareness of what we would call the natural moral law, but they make the they argue that you don't need God uh, to have that awareness uh, uh, now, or or for that that to be a reality. Now, I think ultimately the flaw in the Wilson Roos view is that it can't account for uh, why I should be good tomorrow. In other words, there's there's no uh, the, the there's no duty that one has to obey the law. Uh, all that one has is a story about how we have these sort of what it seems to be an awareness of, of a natural law, but it doesn't say why we should obey it. <laughs> and I think ultimately that's, that's the flaw in that view that it's uh, you can easily have somebody say, well, I, you know, and I'm glad that my predecessors, uh, acted consistently with this seemingly moral law, but I choose not to obey it. And without, I think, some sort of authority behind uh, the natural law, as Aquinas says, he who has care of the community, uh, I, don't, I think it becomes very difficult to explain why one should obey it. Um, that's, yeah, that's fascinating for a variety of ways because it gets us into a, a kind of mayor's nest of ethical debates regarding that transition between descriptivity and, you know, proscriptivity or normativity, yeah. uh, which we're, we're going to just jump over. <laughs> and um, I, think, I think one way in which to jump over it somewhat legitimately without embarrassing, uh, you know, myself is, is just to speak about religion. Um, so... It seems like a lot of these debates regarding relativism concern religious practice or religious belief. Um, and in St. Thomas's understanding, religion is a virtue which is available to our natural power of reasoning. Now, mind you, by virtue of the fact that we have fallen, it's exceedingly difficult for us to come to a knowledge of God as our creator and end by that natural power of reason. And yet, it still remains in force, albeit, um, you know, like diminished, I suppose, um, and that that like lies open to us as a way forward for reconstituting a certain order in our life. So it's like, so thinking about the claims of the relativist who says, typ typically the relativist isn't going to say, you know, do whatever feels right, or this just may as well happen as that just may as well happen. Usually it's a kind of more specified or limited claim about particular modes of, you know, enforcement and oppression. Um, so, so like when it comes to, to these types of religious claims, namely that there is a God, that God has a claim on our life, that that, like the types of demands that that levies upon us regard not only our interior ordering, but our exterior manifestation of worship, and that this is actually for our good. Can you think of like argumentative strategies or the types of conversations that you might have had that, that, that help people to come to an appreciation of this? Because it sounds so utterly foreign from the type of conversation which is taking place in the secular public square, if there is any, 
you know, conversation taking place uh, apart from the shouting. So I, I don't know if you see any yeah. kind of avenues that lie open. So, you know, I haven't done a lot of thinking about that aspect of, of the natural law, except in the area of religious liberty. Uh, so what I, I've seen, and I just published a couple of essays on this, one that appeared in the Civil Rights Law Journal, which is published by George Mason University's Law School. Uh, one of the, th one of the interesting phenomenon that have, phenomena that's occurred in the past 15, 20 years in the academic literature on religious liberty is a, is a kind of a challenge to the idea of why religion is even special. And, when you were talking about, you know, Aquinas's account of the virtue of religion, most of the writers today, legal scholars who are writing in religious liberty, who are not at all friendly to religion, would find that to be absolutely mysterious. <laughs> they, 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 in this sense, that they, they, they don't see why religion should be singled out for special protection. And so what I've done in, in my recent work on this is to single out what, what is it? What is it about religious, uh, religion that, uh, inspired the American founders to single out religious liberty for special protections? Why is it that Dign Indignitatis Humanae, which is the, uh, one of the, uh, declarate or the Declaration of Religious Liberty issued by the Second Vatican Council? Why, why are, what's behind all this? And ultimately, what's driving uh, it is the understanding that human beings have a natural duty to God. <laughs> and But a lot of these recent writers do not believe that belief in God is even rational or reasonable. And they tend to look at religion or as reducible to the psychological state of the individual who is the believer. And so for a lot of these writers, uh, any sort of conscientious claim that one makes should be protected no differently than religion. And so, and one reason for this is that they just don't find the idea of belief in God to be reasonable. So once you have a culture or a civilization in which religious belief itself begins to be doubted, uh, it becomes very difficult for people to understand, well, why should we single out something like this for special protection? It's people hold conscientious beliefs about lots of things. Uh, they may be committed to their favorite football team, or they may you know, love their country, or they feel committed to their profession. Uh, why, why is religion any different? Well, religion is different historically because of this understanding that human beings are ordered towards duty to God. And that implies a kind of a, a higher sovereign to which one is obligated. But if one doesn't believe that that's even reasonable to hold, then it becomes, you know, kind of like, well, you know, what's, what's the point? <laughs> so I, I think that there's, uh, I think in a weird way, I mean, you have to, it, this is the point I, I, I've made in a couple of my writings, a uh, book I published in 2015 with Cambridge called Taking Right Seriously, uh, one of the points I make about religious liberty in terms of this idea of, of the rationality of religious belief is that religious believers in the public square who want to defend religious liberty not only should master the legal arguments, but they also have to be prepared to defend the reasonableness of their religious beliefs. Because whether we like it or not, jurists and politicians and the general public are going to be largely influenced by sort of commonly held views of what counts as reasonable. And if we're not, you know, entering that aspect of the public discussion, it doesn't matter how good our legal arguments are because, you know, courts like any other human institution are manned by people, <laughs> by human beings who are influenced and shaped by the wider culture. So, 
to show that religion is a virtue, I think you need to show that religion is reasonable or that it is something central to human life that people can't live without a kind of higher duty. And you may get it. I mean, you know, I know that some people have, uh, have, I'm not the only person that has made this argument or has made this observation that uh, one of the reasons why we may have greater political uh, pol polarization today is that uh, the ways in which people have had deep commitments in the past, namely in terms of religion, has been dissipating. And so people have to find something else to be deeply committed to. And so a lot of the uh, kind of political commitments have replaced the old fashioned religious ones. Yeah. Now it, it's fascinating that that's, yeah, that's one way of approaching it. I was thinking of another way of approaching it. I don't know that. Yeah. I, I haven't thought about this for more than five seconds, but it strikes me that relativism is a way of creating space so that other gods can occupy the, uh, as it were, family hearth or the, temple or whatever it is. Um, the metaphor is not fully developed, so I'll just lapse into silence. But the basic idea is that uh, it seems that the strategy of relativ relativization is a, is a strategy of de-hierarchization. So that way, things higher have less of a claim or no claim on things lower, so that one can either advance another absolute value or one can advance another relative value, which might ordinarily be subordinate to these kind of higher or more principled claims. Um, and it strikes me that like, yes, yeah, so relativism is often used as a rhetorical strategy to displace religion from the public square. And in so doing, like what, what occupies that, what occupies that space? And I think that you're right when it comes to like the, the way that you've tracked or the way that we've tracked a lot of these movements in the past, you know, 10, 15 years with respect to same sex attraction or transgenderism or whatever else. Um, it, it has, there's a kind of religious fervor to it. And I think a lot of people, you know, like who aren't sympathetic to those types of claims will just dismiss it as fanaticism. But religion has been similarly dismissed as fanaticism in the past. You know, so there's a, there's a similar fervor, there's a similar zeal, which informs these, you know, struggles, or, you know, kind of, um, yeah, like, even like the Marxist narratives themselves have a kind of quasi religious tone to them. So, yeah, our, our time is coming to a close, but I don't know if you have yeah, some, you know, some final thoughts fa apropos. Father, that, that, you know, to tie it back to your earlier comments about epistemic modesty, it's interesting on the issues you mentioned, you know, same-sex attraction, transgenderism, the epistemic modesty is gone. That is, there's no entertaining, at least on one side of the debate, the one that's the, in ascendancy right now in our culture, that that its advocates could be wrong. I had an encounter a couple of years ago at a, giving a talk at a, a law school, an like Ivy League law school about eight years ago. I was actually there to talk about the uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which had not quite gotten to the Supreme Court yet. It was in the lower courts. And there was a woman in the audience that was, uh, you know, very bothered by my defending of Jack Phillips, who was the baker that... Uh, that ultimately winds up winning in the U.S. Supreme Court. He uh, And I asked her, I said, is it, you know, Jack Phillips holds a particular view about the liturgical significance of a, of, of, of marriage. He gets that from his Christian tradition. Um, it's no different in his mind than, let's say, a bar mitzvah or a baptism, <laughs> that it has a kind of significance that differs from other sorts of events. And that isn't it possible that your re, your understanding of his commitment to Christian marriage is colored by your political advocacy that you're not looking at it in through his eyes? And it was interesting. She said, "I'd never thought of that before." Uh, and and I said, "You see that that uh, that you know that you." You know, you're requiring that he, uh, you know, abandon uh, or look at the issue of same-sex weddings the way you look at it. But you've got to understand from his perspective, he is seeing this as part of a long and noble tradition that he thinks he derives from Scripture, that the 
uh, that marriage between a man and a woman is analogous to a relationship between Christ and the church, that, that there's all this stuff tied into it that's just, it's just not like, um, getting a driver's license or, or a hunting license. It's something, it's one of these, one of these few types of activities that happens to be both have liturgical significance in most religions and also is civilly recognized. So, and then my, my point of that, uh, of, of telling her that was, was that to kind of suggest that, uh, that maybe, uh, you know, that the, the, the call for epistemic modesty should go both ways <laughs> in our, pu- our public culture. And so, yeah, so you find that you, I think you're right, uh, that there's a kind of selective relativism, that, that there's relativism as a debunking strategy to, to, that ultimately is employed to establish an alternative set of unassailable moral views. Yeah. Which, yeah, we've heard it said, those who choose not to worship will end up worshiping in the end. I forget exactly how it's formulated, but at the end of the day, we're all going to worship, which is to say, to declare worthy of one one's whole heart something, if not in heaven, then here on earth or otherwise. <laughs> All right. Well, th- thanks so much for taking the time. Um, I wonder if, by way of parting comment, you could um, you, you mentioned a couple of uh, publications that were pertinent to the conversation. If you might just highlight uh, two or three that you think would be good for our listeners to follow up with. Yeah, I have a, a piece that um, I've not published yet, but it's accessible online. It's on Dignitatis Humanae. If you Google my name, uh, you'll find my website, francisbeckwith.com. And there I have a a list of, uh, of, of writings that are accessible. Um, so there's one that I've written on Dignitas Humanae that I'm kind of still working on. So if any of anyone who reads it, uh, has a comment, but, uh, they could, you know, certainly write me and, and, uh, and, you know, critique me if, if they like, uh, but in that, in that essay, uh, I, what I, I, I discuss in great detail how, the world has changed since Dignitatis Humanae that much of what the church council said about religious liberty uh, that seemed at the time to be uh, the church's way of dealing with the modern world has changed, that the modern world of 1965 is not the modern world of 2023 and that we have different sorts of uh, issues today that, that weren't present then. And then uh, my 2015 book, Taking Right Seriously, that's R-I-T-E-S, uh, and it's uh, subtitled as Law, um, Law, Politics, and the Reasonableness of Faith. It's a book on how, ju- mostly about how judges and legal scholars misunderstand the nature of religious beliefs. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's an attempt to uh, clarify what exactly it is that religious people hold to. And generally I'm dealing with mostly Christians and Jews, uh, the most, you know, the, at least in the U S context, the most dominant religious views and how courts, uh, have, have not treated, uh, at least some courts, um, have, have treated religious belief as either being, um, not fully rational or, um, uh, can't be understood unless you come up with some sort of secular analogy to understand it. And I think both are a mistaken way to think about religion. Hmm. Great. All right. Well, thanks again. Um, And then turning now to you, the listener, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Off Campus Conversations. If you haven't yet, do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, whether on YouTube or on your podcast app. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you at the next opportunity. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll talk to you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast.